Well, thank you very much. So hi everyone, um, it is true that I'm not from the world of crypto, however, I am from the world of decentralized communication, which as we will see is distinctly adjacent. Um, so I'm not going to talk that much about Matrix, but just the general challenges that we've seen over the last 10 years, if you can believe that, of going and building a decentralized communication protocol. First of all, probably a fairly easy question, why is decentralized communication important? Well, needless to say, we are seeing Discord heading down, putting ads everywhere, running LLM models to try to de-anonymize their users. We have Slack going and analyzing everybody's private messages, including all DMs for AI training, and the way to opt out is to delete your account, apparently. You have Discord banning people for posting ASNs. Yes, that's an autonomous system number. Apparently, if you put too many AS numbers into a chat, your account may get vaped. You've got Slack banning up people who went on holiday to Cuba. You've got Signal being blocked in Iran. You've got teams going down every other day. And you've got the US government issuing an emergency order in terms of Microsoft days you are losing their signing keys for all of their corporate email. And, and the list goes on. The problems of centralized communication are spectacular. So the key thing is that centralization like this will last until the wind changes, until the next Elon level mass extinction event. Decentralization, of course, can last and should last forever. So in Matrix, the way we think about decentralization is that no single party should own your conversations. Conversations themselves should be multilaterally shared across all participants. There should never be able to be a Facebook or a Google or a Signal going and sitting at the center of a web. Matrix itself is an open source project um, providing secure decentralized real-time comms. You may use it for chat, but people also use it for VoIP or for communication within VR, AR, or it's a general kind of pub sub fabric for any kind of relatively low latency real-time data exchange like I know, IoT data. And the whole point is to try to build the real-time communication layer of the open web. And the web here, we're talking about web 1.0, basically, as much as 2 or web 3, in terms of just being that missing ingredient to make it as simple to send a message as an HTTP hit and to receive a message as an HTTP get. Um, some quick stats to try to establish my credibility to talk about this. On the Matrix Network, um, you can see that we've been steadily growing over the years, where it's about 143 million total known addresses, and that includes everything, so it's a bit cheeky because it includes guests and bridged users and people who took one look and then ran a mile. Um, probably a better graph is the actual visible monthly active users. So this is based on phone home stats, the, basically the only centralized bit of matrix, which is very strictly opt-in, where people can choose to phone home aggregate stats so we can see roughly how many users there are. And you can see it's at around four and a half million monthly active at the moment, um, increasing relatively linearly um, over the years, although it sort of goes in um, phases and cycles, and we're at the beginning, hopefully, of a new cycle um, right now. And this is obviously an understeer for the number of people on the network because many of them quite reasonably don't phone home with stats and perhaps some of them aren't even really federating and participating in the wider network. And apparently, according to Stack Overflow, so it must be true, we are the most admired synchronous communication tool, even more admired than Discord. You can see us at 72.73% and Discord at like 72.71%. Um, and also the most desired open source one. However, there is a massive gap, obviously, um, in terms of our little blue dot there showing how desired we are for people who actually want to use Matrix at work versus people who want to use Slack or Discord. So that is the gap um, to close and the gap that this talk is about. Um, in terms of the Matrix ecosystem itself, you get a spec. Um, which is a big monolithic wodge of open API, Swagger, and Markdown. You then get various server implementations. The green ones are published by the Matrix Foundation. Um, uh, the kind of purpley ones on the left are done by Element, the company that we set up to try to fund Matrix Dev. And then the purple ones on the far right are third party ones from the wider ecosystem. So you get a Python server, you get a Go server, you get lots of bridges and bots. You then have on the third party side servers in Rust including Conduit and very recently announced Conduit, not to be confused with Conduit. Conduit is a fork of Conduit um, 
um, focusing on performance above all else. You've got eJapid, the XMPP server now also speaks Matrix and Erlang. You have Elixir implementations and all sorts of other things. And then on the client side, we have basically three generations of SDKs. You have one written in JavaScript, iOS, and Android, which, for instance, the Element app sits on top of. Then we have, ish, a progressive web app um, SDK called Hydrogen, being the lightest element, which allows you to build embeddable um, PW and things like our third room metaverse environment. Then we've got our next gen, where all the effort is going into Matrix Rust SDK, which is a full client-side Rust stack, including Rust end-to-end -end encryption, which then puts native UI on top for things like Element X, our next gen client from Element, but also Fractal on the GNOME project side of things. And there's also an amazing um, Vi clone chat client called IMB, built on top of um, Matrix Rust SDK as well. Then you've got loads and loads and loads of clients, things like Mozilla Thunderbird, natively talking Matrix, NeoChat um, for the KDE ecosystem, Fractal for GNOME, GoMux for command line, Watch the Matrix for your Apple Watch, Neko for a Telegram clone written in Qt and C++, and the list goes on and on and on. So that's what Matrix is. Um, it tends to get used an awful lot by the public sector, rather amusingly, despite the fact we built it as a somewhat anarchical, um, democratized communication. It turns out the governments really like to run their own communication too. So um, the cash in the ecosystem tends to come at the moment from people like the Department of Defense, not to be confused with the Department of Decentralization, um, people like the German military, Bundeswehr, NRW, um, the UN, NATO, UK government, the Netherlands, and many, many more. And then finally, the foundation um, operates on a membership model, and we're actually in the middle of governing board elections happening right now, so that people can basically steer the direction of the protocol. More on governance in a bit. So, now for the actual talk bit. Why is decentralized communication so hard? Well, to answer it, my guess is that decentralizing something is 10x harder than building it in a centralized model, at least. And we even have the data to show it. Because if you look at the history of Matrix, rather depressingly, the team has been together for over 20 years. It is now old enough to drink. So we started off building APIs for PSTN connectivity um, and did lots and lots of SIP and XMPP and IRC stuff. We got acquired by a telco vendor, and after a few years of working in the phone network industry, we concluded we needed to burn the phone network to the ground, and that is where Matrix came from. But in those three years, we went and built something that looks identical to Matrix, except it was centralized. It was proprietary, and it was just an in-house chat, VoIP, um, and file transfer platform. It was really a clone of WhatsApp. So we then literally took the same team, the same set of about 15 people, and said, good news, everybody, we're going to do it again. But this time, it will be decentralized and open source. How hard can it be? We know how to do this. And here we are, literally 10 years later, still almost at the sort of end of the beginning phase, in my mind, in terms of getting Matrix to the point, frankly, with parity to our old product from 10 years ago, let alone parity with Slack or WhatsApp, et cetera. Like one of the really nice features we had in the original pre-Matrix thing was streaming file transfer. So I could start a voice message or a video message, and everybody else in the room can just hit go on it and start playing it in real time. So you basically have a live streaming platform for free. It's amazing, lovely. Why don't we have that in Matrix today? Well, the answer is end-to-end -end encryption, where it turns out that um, uh, designing your streaming file transfers in a way that a man in the middle can't substitute it out or generally mess around with it because you can't hash something that you haven't said yet um, is surprisingly hard. So th this is basically um, where the thesis comes from, that decentralizing something like comms is about 10x harder, because it's literally taken us 10x longer with the same set of people to do the same thing. So we launched Matrix in 2014. End-to-end um, -end encryption dev began the next year. We then created Element as a flagship client in 2016. And then the core Matrix team set up Element as a company to try to fund uh, Matrix dev. Then we set up the foundation in 2019 to protect Matrix from the evil people at Element. And then um, turned on end-to-end -end encryption in 2020. That last year, um, started work on Matrix 2.0, which is basically getting Matrix to performance parity with what you would expect from Discord or WhatsApp or Slack, despite being decentralized and open source. And then hopefully, this summer, we'll be going GA on Matrix 2.0. So let us talk about the perils of decentralization. 
First of all, focus. If I could pick one thing that we have screwed up monumentally, that is why it has taken us 10 years to get to this point, rather than, I don't know, four or five years, it would be focus. And I think everybody in their career has various epiphanies. I know software developers will realize at some point that building simple things is better than building complicated things, and that boring technology is good. You know, managers will realize that they should hire people who are smarter than they are, and this is a good thing. They become a multiplier, all the rest of it. I think in the last six months, I've had the career epiphany of the importance of focus. Only 10 years too late. So the idea of focus is in a centralized world, I mean, it's, it's still a big problem, but you basically pick an audience for your product and you build for it. So if you're Discord, you say, I'm going to build for gamers and it's going to kick ass. If you're WhatsApp, you're going to say, I'm going to replace SMS with an over-the-top app. So in a decentralized world, well, first of all, <laughs> we're building a protocol. And the flexibility that that protocol could be used for basically anything in the communication space is obviously the really exciting biggest strength and also its biggest weakness. And I suspect I do not need to tell an Ethereum audience the challenges of having an incredibly powerful, flexible technology, um, but you know, which almost makes everybody sprint in different directions. So when we set up Element in 2016, we sat down and we wrote out every business model we could think of of companies you could build on top of Matrix. And we got 75 completely non-overlapping business models which we had to pick from. And then there are questions like, do you build a killer app? And many projects just haven't had a killer app. There hasn't been the amazing wallet on day one. There hasn't been a sort of flagship way to use the protocol. Um, we decided that we really did want one. Uh, we were kind of copying Netscape in the early days of the web and wanted Element to be the Netscape equivalent to try to bootstrap this new technology. Um, but then for what audience? And frankly, we did not define a crisp audience at all. It was like, well, it's going to be a WhatsApp replacement and a Slack replacement and a Discord replacement, and it's going to be used by geeks, and it's going to be used by governments, and it's going to be used by everybody. This is going to be great. Turns out that is not a sufficient level of focus. Um, a big controversial thing is do you build some showcases for the protocol to inspire use? We've got a lot of bad um, sort of feedback over the years because we've built some pretty crazy things on top of Matrix to try to show off the protocol. We've built an entire spatial computing metaverse platform called Third Room with its own game engine. We've gone and built MIDI over Matrix. We've gone and done heart sensor data over Matrix. We've done and loads of different clients and different experimental things. My justification was, first of all, I wanted to have fun, and secondly, I wanted to try to show off what was possible on the technology, that it's not just a clone of WhatsApp. Was that the right thing to do? I don't know. We've spent a lot of time and energy on these projects, and at the moment, most of them are on ice. Another big question is, do you focus on developer experience? So much of the early bits of Matrix were actually optimized not for whatever the end user app would be, but making it really fun to hack on as a developer. Like the classic example was um, somebody on Hacker News said, I will never use Matrix because I cannot connect to you with a telnet tel client, whereas I can telnet into my IRC server. And so I went and wrote a um, bash um, five-line script that was a fully functional Matrix client and said, ha -ha, look how easy it is to work on. In practice, in retrospect, in some ways, I think this was a total waste of time because when you add end-to-end -end encryption into the mix, your client suddenly becomes incredibly complicated and incredibly fragile and security critical, and you definitely can't write an end-to-end -end encrypted matrix client in five lines of bash. So did we oversteer on developer experience? Then probably the most controversial one, do you build for developers full stop? What are, who is your audience? Are you building a thing by devs for devs, or are you building it for early adopters? for people who really, really like custom emoji and are very unhappy that Matrix still doesn't have merged custom emoji support? Or do you look more for the sort of, the people on the other side of the chasm who are gonna be the ones who really take it um, um, sort of big scale? Do you go and try to find something that some random person at the United Nations can use instead of Signal or WhatsApp to communicate? Then do you build forks of your own client? Or do you just build your own client? Like we have now built at least three or four forks uh, element of our own app for different people. We did one for the whole French state called CHAP. We did, um, well, we started at least Bundeswehr Messenger for the Bundeswehr. Um, the NATO one again gets its own app and they all start sprouting off in different directions and the distraction and lack of focus is in some ways catastrophic. On the plus side though, we actually got paid some money to keep the project going. And then finally, do you build domain specific stuff? 
I don't know, if um, Gematic, the German healthcare agency, is um, mandated matrix for communication in the healthcare sector. Therefore, an obvious thing to do is to build the world's best kick-ass healthcare matrix client with lots of um, sort of uh, workflow systems and calendar integrations and all this jazz. Or do you not? Do you sit back and let a bunch of German healthcare vendors go and do that instead? Good question. And finally, from a protocol perspective, do you focus on your own protocol, or do you also try to bridge to everyone else? And so we've just come to the end of a massive exercise with Meta, getting WhatsApp integrated with Matrix as part of the Digital Markets Act. And I need to put out a blog post that's been sitting, needing to be get pushed for about a week now, asking the world what they make of this, and uh, also asking them to help fund it if they think it's a useful thing for the world to have. And there was an awful lot of effort going in there, basically fixing the impedance mismatch between WhatsApp's use of the signal double ratchet and how Matrix uses signal end-to-end -end encryption and making them interoperate, which we did. But should we have just focused on Matrix, or is Matrix about connecting through to other things too? These are some of the big distractions which you just don't need to worry about if you're Discord. Another one is governance. So. Centralized world governance is pretty easy. You shall use my app. If you're lucky, really lucky, you might even get APIs. In a decentralization world, I had totally misunderstood, uh, misestimated the amount of work that would go into my job as project lead in governance. So first of all, after a couple of years of happy utopia, pushing out implementations that basically worked, people started to say, but hang on a second, where is the spec? You said, this is a protocol. I need to have you know, a, a proper version spec, a proper spec process. And so we said, oh, OK, I guess we should start kind of ratifying how this thing works. And you know, how should it work? Should there be a monolithic spec? Should there be modules on top of it? Um, are forks a feature or a bug? And honestly, this is a bit of matrix I think that we got right in that there is only one monolithic spec. Anybody can go and fork it in any direction, and that is how it evolves. And then we have a spec core team of about 10 people who vote on what gets into the core. So it's a bit of an oligarchy, but in practice it works relatively well, certainly in comparison with, say, XMPP, where you have a cloud of XMPP extensions and you, you never have a sort of single checkpointed version of the standard. But then who actually controls that spec? Should that be owned by the foundation? Should that be owned by the community? Do you work with a standards body like IETF? Do you create your own standards body? Do you have a BDFL? Or is it a company or community-led initiative? Do you build fast or do you build slow? And that one is particularly sensitive because on one hand, you have to try to build fast to compete with the centralized guys when you are already going 10 times slower but then the screams of pain that come from the community if you tried to do the equivalent of pushing your hard fork too rapidly and everybody has to update their clients and servers and they get very upset is a real challenge. And a really surprising thing that I never anticipated is the extreme confusion that happens when the spec and the implementation don't match. And it was really weird because no, we, we did the implementations, and then we very clearly derived the spec from what the implementations did. And we didn't get it perfect, and occasionally people would feel, find a gap, and they would melt down with stress on, I don't understand, the spec can't be wrong because it's a spec. It's the documentation. The documentation can't be wrong. And obviously, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, you have to basically make a call. Should you publish reference implementations? Like historically, we did, and then we stopped calling them reference once there are enough alternatives out there. Now, W3C doesn't push out reference implementations these days. Why should the Matrix Foundation? For that matter, should you have a foundation at all, or should you use an umbrella like the Linux Foundation or, I don't know, Software Conservancy? Should the foundation have a governing board? Um, no, who should actually steer this thing? And as I mentioned earlier, we've just set up ours. It is a pay-to-play thing. You get to vote if you donate more than 60 bucks a year um, to the Matrix Foundation. Um, and it's a useful way to try to raise cash. And should the foundation yet yeah, publish those implementations? So many governance things. Sorry that I'm just throwing out questions rather than giving answers, but you can probably infer some of the answers here. Agility is another big, big thing that the likes of Discord don't need to worry about because they can change anything they like and they just block the old apps. Done. However, in Matrix, we have never broken backwards compatibility. We want to be the missing communication layer of the web. 
the web, as anybody who's been to spacedrome.com slash 1999, or 1996 even, knows, it never breaks its backwards compatibility if we ignore when they remove the blink and the marquee tags. And likewise, Matrix ascribes to the same idea. So we have this idea of room versions that allow you to evolve the protocol on a per room basis. These are meant to be invisible. So if you can, you can basically upgrade any aspect of Matrix whilst the conversation's going on. And as long as the servers and the clients understand the new version of the protocol, it can checkpoint and switch over. It is a veritable ship of Theseus in terms of letting the whole thing evolve from under you. However, one thing we haven't solved is migrating data. And so at the moment, um, everything has to talk, every previous version of Matrix events, and um, back to day one, which luckily hasn't changed that much. But I foresee a disaster on the horizon with post-quantum encryption, where uh, we may need to re-encrypt everything, if it turns out that all of the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchanges over the last eight years have been stored and replayed, and the bad guys now have, every have everybody's keys. Obviously, you'd need to re-encrypt um, and uh, create new events. So we need to figure out how to do this sort of migration. And then there's this whole problem. The clients were meant to be thin and easy, but then they become distinctly less agile with end-to-end -end encryption. Or worse, you end up with a monoculture where the Rust in implementation is the main way to do encryption. And everybody just uses that, which is obviously not healthy from a monoculture perspective. Uh, that said, we do have big changes on the horizon. We did one for Matrix 1.0, which was to deny self-signed certificates on servers. For Matrix 2.0, coming up in a few months, we are authenticating media so people can stop using Matrix as an infinite binary um, dump. And we are also switching authentication to OpenID Connect everywhere. So any client that can't speak OIDC isn't going to be able to log in anymore. But when we do these things, it takes literally months for the ecosystem to catch up. End-to-end -end encryption is probably the other biggest challenge here. In a centralized world, you either just don't bother because it contradicts your business model, like Discord, they want to sell ads, they want to mine your data. You, know, you can just lie through your teeth, like Telegram, and tell everybody that you're a secure messenger, except you then don't turn on encryption other than for the secret one-to-one -one chats. Um, you can do it as a single point of failure, like Signal, or you can do it as a semi-trusted single point of failure, like WhatsApp. In a decentralized world, you obviously have to have it because the data is getting smeared across everywhere. It's getting replicated across zero trust, untrusted servers. So if somebody steals your keys, you want to have perfect forward secrecy. Your future messages should be protected. And that is a massive pain in the ass um, to get right because it basically means that the users need to uh, protect their keys and uh, protect them by having some kind of passphrase that might exist on the server if they want history. So you have this huge trade-off of do you want you know, to be resilient to attacks in the future or do you want history on the server? And it turns out that everybody is used to Discord and Slack, etc., and they want the history on the server. Therefore, they can't have PFS unless you go and jump through heaps to protect that history. Then you've got the problem of who do you actually encrypt for? And I'm sure that anybody who has used Matrix has encountered the horror of unable to decrypt errors. And all of these boil down to the risk that the client basically doesn't know what other clients are in the room because of decentralization. Because there might have been a net split, because there might have been an old server that comes back and claims that it has different membership to elsewhere and um, all sorts of other horrible edge cases. And one of the big design questions is, do you keep track in a global ledger of some kind? Do you have sort of sealed chunks of a blockchain of some kind? Or do you just have one great big DAG which can diverge forever, which is more the case with Matrix? And many people use that as a feature. Now, if you're a NATO or somebody, you want a submarine to be able to go and hide for six months and then the conversation to sync up when you come back online. So another thing is, how do you, do you even support non-end-to-end -end encryption? And today we do, because there are still many, many clients in UK use cases who don't actually want end-to-end -end encryption. But um, this is a huge challenge in its own right, because you then can't use end-to-end -end encryption to manage the group membership. So we're battling with that right now in terms of whether we come up with a dialect of matrix where the group membership is managed at the encryption layer rather than the old school matrix layer. And then finally, identity crisis. End-to-end -end encryption is completely useless if you don't check who you're talking to. 
So we're in the process of shifting to trust on first use. So at least you trust the person initially and get warned if they change their identity. But then transitive trust. You know, if I trust Bob, does do I automatically trust Charlie because Bob trusts Charlie? How do you do that without leaking metadata? Do you have key transparency systems? Are they decentralized key transparency where everybody can publish basically attestations of their public keys so that everybody else um, can have some confidence of who they are? And frankly, this is a mess right now, not just for Matrix, but for the ecosystem as a whole. I mean, WhatsApp, of all people, got ahead of the curve by publishing contact transparency databases. Then iMessage added it. I think Google is proposing a decentralized one in the form of Mimi Land, but um, there isn't um, a solution on the Matrix side yet. And this is absolutely critical and also really not a problem just for Matrix. Now, I am completely running out of time, so I'm just going to start skipping stuff desperately. Access control. Suffice it to say, access control is hard. Centralized world, single authority gets to say who does what. In Matrix, we accidentally created an entirely new topic, which is the state resolution idea where we have an authentication DAG. Every server sends a proof, not a zero knowledge proof, just a plain old proof of why it can perform an operation. Everybody else executes a proof before they accepting the operation, and this gives you zero trust, decentralized ACLs. It's academically novel, it's really hard. V1 had security bugs, embarrassingly. V2 has non-security bugs, where old events can roll back room state. We're working on it right now. Metadata, everyone's favorite subject with Matrix. Centralized, obviously, a centralized server can see who is talking to who. You look at the network traffic. If they put it through a mixed net, then they're not really centralized anymore. In decentralized worlds, if the conversation isn't on my server, I cannot see that metadata. So for all the people who accuse Matrix of having bad metadata stunts, my answer is go run your own server and don't tell anybody it exists. However, um, you also have a trade-off that if you do sync history um, server side, then the server does need to store some metadata to efficiently sync it to the client. How much do you store? What does it look like? How much do you obfuscate it? And at the moment, we're playing with the idea of moving to more of a signal model, where you basically put store and forward blobs of obfuscated data on the server, rather than the kind of IMAP vibe that we have today, where you just get the metadata of what conversations exist, who's in them, and what messages were sent and when, but not what's in them, obviously. Funding, won't talk too much about funding. Um, centralized, you raise money and then you exit. Decentralized, we could have added a token, but we wanted to avoid getting entangled with the complexities of ICOs and regulations. No offense to anyone here. Um, instead, we basically got funded by secondhand ICOs. So thank you to Status, who did our seed funding, and MetaPlanet and Protocol Labs, um, who have very kindly funded Matrix over the years. However, if you ignore the ICO tokenization style paths, there are so many questions here, and I spend way too much of my time trying to persuade people to provide grants or philanthropy, um, basically open source funding of the commons. We are in a banana situation where many European governments rely operationally on matrix and yet don't necessarily feed any money back to support it. Um, if you're feeling particularly enthusiastic and rich, QR code there. Um, then trust and safety. Absolute nightmare. Centralization, you scan for abuse, you use lots of machine learning, and you get rid of it. Decentralization, first of all, abuse is almost a feature. Who are you to say uh, what abuse is in a decentralized world? You can't have a centralized authority. So we've been building out subjective decentralized rep that users and communities can subscribe to and publish to. But then you have the problem of how do you stop people subscribing to the really, really bad stuff and using it in reverse in order to find really, really bad stuff. And frankly, trust and safety gets stuck reacting to abuse rather than building tooling. Finally, lots of devil in the details. We've seen many people do it really wrong, like Activity Pub. So, ideas. Should we have added federation later? Should we have started centralized and then bolted on decentralization later, like Blue Sky did? Um, should federation be equal or should it be asymmetrical? Should um, portable identities, uh, are portable identities enough? Do you actually need to be able to move accounts between servers if you can just put up a DNS record to point to a server of your choice? Um, should we have moved to the Signal model earlier? Should we have crowdfunded Element rather than going down uh, effectively a VC route? Should we have published the spec much sooner or much, much later? Should we have just gone off to direct to consumer? And finally, should Matrix actually be all about object graphs rather than messages? Who knows? I think I'm out of time. Um, but thank you very much for listening to my TED Talk. <laughs> thank you so much.